Okay. So good morning, everyone. Bon dia. And now it's time for you. So uh, the idea is that uh, first of all, I would like to to invite the, the speakers if they want to add some comments to other people speak uh, talk. If, if I don't know if Andreas wants to add something uh, about what has been told before. I, uh, afterwards, with a uh, no, because because you, you mentioned um, something. I have some questions, but before, if you want, if you want to talk uh, about uh, other other uh, the other speakers' presentation, because uh, for instance, when when you present the, the 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 study, it was somehow understood that everything has to be open, and it has been changed a little bit because it's what uh, Jean-Claude has mentioned about the open by default, but as open as possible, as close as necessary. So maybe then we could fulfill. Uh, I have a, another question about legal question. If it could be legal to deposit uh, data closely, there is a project from Harvard called Data Tax that they are offering tools to deposit data even with uh, encrypted data when there, there is sensitive data, and then at least everybody could have a, like a catalog of data, knowing that the data exists, even the data is closed, mm -hmm. so maybe then we can find some protocols. So that's one question for you. Another question for Christoph, for instance, I, I, I agree with some comments about the public domain mark and the Creative Commons license, uh, I, don't, I, I, I know that in the afternoon there is a, a breakout session dedicated to license, so we can discuss furthermore about the data and the problem that suppose in Europe the database rights, that also has another issue. And to Jean-Claude, I also have another question about who evaluates the opt-out? So meaning, I can say I have IPR issues, I have but do you evaluate that, or you just accept it as it is? So I don't know. Just three questions that I just jump, and I, I will invite the other people to, to jump. Yeah, as you addressed me, maybe I will start. Um, yeah, it was very interesting to to uh, hear that um, it's not about openness as a uh, as a uh, utmost principle, but. Um, as open as possible, um, but of course, considering what I mentioned about data protection, um, we have a here basic conflict, and the question is if we uh, really adhere to what data protection um, um, may force us to do, is it still open access in the end, what will come out of it? Uh, so, um, um, I'm not sure if it's really possible to uh, absolutely um, um, live up to data protection standards and still keep the level of open access that we want to. Of course, it's always a way to find solutions, and there are, there are always solutions, and one solution may be encryption, you mentioned. This is the other, uh, next to anonymization, maybe the other technical way out of the problems, and it's also just discussed on a general level. Um, as, a, as a means for protection of data in general, to have it encrypted on a very low technical basis. So as soon as data produced, it will be encrypted and only decrypted uh, at the end user or the user who really uses it. That I'm not an informatic, but what, what I read and heard from inf informatic people it may be a way, but of course then you create another problem of management because, as you mentioned, you have to give people uh, access to the encrypted data and then you have to draft again some kind of management system which also includes um, giving certain people rights and other people not rights and so, so again create new problems of, of management of, of such a system. So. Everything has its ups and downs, and it's it's uh, very difficult. To, uh, but maybe Niels also has some um, something to add. He didn't uh, involved yet, so I think yeah. he also has something to say. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Very challenging technique. Uh, well, I would uh, have a question for Jean Claude. Um, you. Um, who showed us the statistic of the opt-outs out of the pilot. My question is, uh, can't I as a project participate in the pilot and write a data management plan that says uh, I don't open up any data? 
isn't this possible? So is the statistic somehow not a uh, whole reality? my thing. <laughs> uh, so, um, so on to, um, to, to, to take the two questions maybe at the same time. So, so I, I, would, I would find it extremely remarkable if, if uh, a project opting in or opting out in 2016, 2017 of uh, post-Christus, uh, <laughs> these days will not think about a, a DMP plan, full stop. I mean, in, in, in our data-driven science reality, it's a bit remarkable if, if people would still uh, consider submitting large consortia, large projects without thinking of DMP. Regardless if they opt in or out, I think this should be standard. And I actually think doctoral school should, should give a mandatory uh, course, uh, course on that. To be more precise on your question, of course, uh, all the opt-out uh, projects can certainly uh, write a DMP and, and it is actually encouraged also somewhere in, in the rules, but it is not taken uh, into consideration in the, in, the, uh, in the evaluation. So it is not used as, a, as an argument uh, later on if the, if the project complied with all the requirements. So we do encourage that projects write DMP, but if they opt out, they don't share it. You see? So that is because they don't want to, I mean, they share the data to the project officers and within the consortium, but they don't share it in the repository. So that is, it is, it is uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, a zero-sum game in, in, in that respect. And, and as you said, so who evaluates this? Well, do we have uh, uh, all our project officers out to so the people organizing the evaluation and, and, and uh, bringing together the panels for evaluating the projects? They, 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 do, they do the job there. And I also think if I may to, to, to come back on, on what you said, um, I, I really think we have to try to come up with a, a dynamic approach into defining these, uh, these problematic issues of personal and, and uh, privacy and so on, because a static, a static approach will simply, simply not work. If, if, if in 10 years' time we all have implants to regulate something, now, before we fix that legally, I mean, our, the pharmaceutical industry will have already done it. So, so it, is, it is something we have to say probably more on a case-by-case on a case case basis, and the cases can be enormous. Uh, they are not Mickey Mouse cases here, and, and we should try to come up with the dynamic approach. And I, that's why I think, and that's what the point I wanted to make, I think it's very important that the, the community and the disciplines themselves have an important say in, in this, that it is not only let uh, not only the, 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 the mandate of legal or, or, uh, or uh, technical people to judge on this, but the communities themselves should, should have a voice in, 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 this, in, the, in deciding on what the dynamic uh, framework could be. Yes, uh, well actually I would like to, um, since you mentioned the, the license uh, question again, <clears throat> Um, picking the license uh, is a bit tricky. Um, the, uh, and maybe uh, uh, Andreas Wiebe can comment on it because you know, he's, the, he's the real expert on that. Um, the uh, CC community claims that using um, the CC0 uh, license is possible even uh, within jurisdictions that limit what you can waive. Um, there has even been a, a, a ported version just, a, I don't know, a month or two ago of the new of the CC by, of the CC suit uh, 4.0, you know, transferred to, uh, to German, uh, uh, not only the language, but um, changed a, a little bit. I'm not 100% sure um, if, the, um, if the lawyers would fully agree um, that um, the CC0 license is fully um, applicable. Um, uh, that's, that's the problem. Um, so um, if, it's, if people feel comfortable, they can use it. Beside this um, 
this, le this possible legal issue, there is this psychological thing uh, to which I alluded earlier. Uh, for many people, it is very difficult um, to waive all rights. Um, so it may be something we like, but that actually brings me to what I consider my main message. I think um, we need a framework that is to be provided by the research organizations that takes a lot of the responsibility concerning making data available away from the researcher and provides certain workflows which um, you are, are then perceived as just being the normal workflow and then it just goes that way. Um, if we ask the people to do all these individual uh, data management plans and everything, I mean, they, they may be applicable on the strictly scientific um, level, but concerning the legal level, um, it's far too complicated uh, for the scientists. We need to provide for them um, a set of rules that works kind of across the board as long as they are a member of a certain organization. It's a bit tricky, this is a bit hidden. Um, yeah, as to the waiving of rights, uh, the CC with the CC license, um, of course, the situation in different countries is different as well in this respect. Um, you also have to take into account that there's uh, different rights involved. It's not only copyright, it's also the database right maybe involved, which is, uh, has come quite late into the CC <laughs> complex as well. And uh, for copyright, for example, in our continental systems, it's not possible to waive co copyright completely whereas the database right is, the situation is a bit different. Um, the um, problem is, um, but there are maybe two more problems also with this uh, waiving of, or with this CC0 right, which I, I, I think applies when there are no rights involved. Uh, the, first, the first one is if you, do, if you have a license that is not based on any right, copyright or other right, um, it only uh, is valid between the parties. So once this, the information gets out, outside of the contract to a third party, you cannot control it anymore with this kind of license, un unless the third party is also bound by this license. And of course, um, even if there's no right, copyright or other rights involved, um, the validity of uh, such a license is still subject to general civil law standards. And this means, uh, for one thing, uh, there's a um, kind of standard control um, mechanism uh, which is, has different levels of strictness in different countries. For example, in Germany we have very strict control of standard contracts. There's also a European directive, but the, the levels in the member states are different of this kind of control. And there's also um, a, review, a review according to competition law, cartel law. And these are the, the main subjects. There is, a, for example, a European court decision if if you license, for example, a database that is not protected by database rights, you can put as many re restrictions as possible, but subject to national law. And then you have to look to national law, German, Italian, French, and so on, how strict the control of these contracts are. And this um, adds the problem that we have different levels, even within Europe, of this kind of control. So it's a quite a bit complicated legal situation as well. So, perfect, you are preparing the session for the afternoon. Uh, please, if there is any question, there are a few questions there. So I'll pass around. And you can introduce yourself and then we know you come from. Okay. Uh, I'm Jörg Eiger from Germany. Uh, I'm in the biobanking field. And so we are very much concerned with uh, privacy questions. Um, what we came basically down, so basically one comment and one question. Uh, one comment would be, uh, what we came down basically is with regard to data quality, there's no way uh, to get off the, the requirement for consent because uh, anonymization basically means a reduction of data quality to, to a level that they are, they are no longer usable in a, in a really reasonable way. So we have to stick to a consent and our aim is to implement kinds of a, uh, broad consent, uh, which is basically, it, it's, it's a legal problem, actually. But as long as we are, and that's our opinion, as long as we are flanking methods to that, like ethical committees, IRBs, uh, technical uh, restrictions, um, we hope that we can implement it in a way that it's usable 
and it's acceptable from the legal and from the individual. Um, I think this is the way to go because there are no real alternatives, in my opinion, to that. Um, and just a question following that. Um, different issue, but also legal. That's the question of responsibility. What we are uh, very much concerned as well in the medical field is uh, that whenever you give data out, um, there's someone using the data. And um, how can we control, uh, well, how can we be responsible for data that have been generated somewhere and are now used for clinical decisions, for example, in the early, early uh, clinical uh, unit, for example, um, if the data are not valid or of very low quality, there are consequences. There may be consequences for the patient. There may be consequences uh, in a very broad range. Um, who takes the responsibility if these are open data? And we actually cannot stand for the quality for the data be because we haven't generated them. We only have collected them. So, so maybe I, I, I start with um, you, your, your first comment, I, I agree, consent is an, as of now the, the main legal basis uh, to work with and there, as I mentioned we still have the problem that um, it's a bit uncertain uh, under which, uh, which qualifications consent may be valid even to national law, data protection laws. Um, I think it would be helpful if the data Protection Group 29 or its follow-up under the regulation would make some general uh, statement on um, like a commentary on what could be the valid requirements for valid consent and uh, to in introduce this into the legal discussion. Hopefully we will see this uh, in the future. Your last question is quite complicated. It goes, goes back to general civil law. Is there li any kind of liability for information quality? Uh, as of now, um, the um, standards for liability for information are quite uh, broad. So uh, you cannot really make somebody liable for bad, bad information quality. Uh, of course, there are always limits to everything, but uh, generally under tort law at least, uh, it's, it's difficult to make somebody liable. The other question is, I'm not sure if that's, that, that was also your direction. If you um, um, produce personal data and give it to, to somebody else, are you liable what somebody else is doing with the data? Under data protection law, your, the liability is limited to the data processors, so the person who processes the data. Of course, if I give data to somebody else uh, under the new regulation, I'm um, and, and uh, I'm, I'm to a certain degree also responsible in the sense that if the data subject requires me to erase the data and I gave this data also to somebody else, to a third party, I have to use efforts to also get him to erase the data. I'm not, I'm not completely responsible, but I have to provide efforts to, to do this. So there's some kind of data protection also um, responsibility for what third parties are doing with data I gave to them. But maybe Niels also has to add something here. Uh, well, it uh, depends on what the uh, well, new data processor is doing with the data. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. We have another question here. Hi. Um, my name is Maida Devare, and I'm an agricultural scientist. Um, I work at uh, CGIAR, which is a group of 15 centers. We, we're, we mostly are, are located in developing countries. And, and our mandate is to reduce poverty, to, to increase productivity, reduce, you know, f increase food security, um, and natural resource management, that sort of thing. Um, we're about 10,000 staff members, mostly scientists. Um, so, you know, this was very interesting. It's raised at least three issues for me, three major issues. Um, one is the, the, the issue of, of well, uh, data as, you know, the, the, the idea of ownership. Um, I think you mentioned that, that data cannot be owned. But increasingly, what we're finding is that in the countries we work, um, depending on which country it is, civil society organizations particularly are seeing data as, as a monetary um, asset. And so that becomes a real issue for us as we work you know, with, with smallholder farmers. So that's, 
that's a question, I guess, that I, that I would throw to you and ask for, you know, if you have any thoughts on that. The second issue is, I think, what was raised earlier, the issue of consent. When we're working with smallholder farmers who are primarily illiterate or semi-literate, it's a very hard thing to explain, you know, how do we deal with this issue of consent um, and, and who benefits and, and, and the idea of benefit sharing. I mean, for us, I think our assumption is uh, the benefit sharing takes the form mostly of being able to come back to the farmer or the farmers, the community, with improved ways of doing their business, which is, you know, improved productivity, hopefully translates to improved profitability, and, and those are the assumptions behind what we do. It doesn't always play out, and we are taking the data out, so, so there are those sorts of thorny issues to deal with. Um, so so how, would you, how would you, you know, what, what, what sort of guidance would you, would you provide, and especially as funding agencies, how do you, how do you reconcile what you're requiring um, with, with what's the reality on the ground. I mean, I know that, that with the EC, I liked that statement about, you know, as open as possible, as closed as needed. But our primary funders often don't allow that kind of thing. You know, there's a sort of a bottom line, thou shalt make it open. And while I believe in that, it's very hard to actually follow and practice. So there are, there are all kinds of thorny issues when you're working not in Europe, not in the US, you know, not in North America. How, 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 what, what sorts of guidance would you give for that sort of situation? Okay, so um, ah, it works. So let me uh, try to, to to give a few elements because again, I think this is an unfolding discussion for which uh, no one has a, has a, a certain answer. I would say otherwise we would not sit here; we would just do it. Um, now, I, th I think I think the the the, re the requirement for open access is, is unstoppable, and you know we we, we have uh, powerpoints uh, floating around in, in Brussels where we give one example after the other. But if 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 big private funders like Welcome and the Gates Foundation go for mandatory open access across across the life cycle almost of the of the research process. I think it says something, yeah? and, and, and public funders are, are slowly following. The Commission wants to, to lead by example here, so we try to, to, to speed up the process. And because it is, there are a lot of emotions in this discussion, and, and, and there is not always very rational uh, uh, arguments there in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in all this, because to a, certain, to a certain degree, consent, ownership, these issues have been on the table as long as science existed, except that now it is, it is multiplied at, a, at scale X because of the digital availability and the internet. So, so it is, these are not issues that we have not looked at in the past, and quality of data and quality of data production and the reuse of data or the malign reuse of data. These are things that have been existed all the time uh, and for which there were uh, sometimes uh, solutions. The complexity becomes because of, of, of the fact that it is now available at a scale which was unprecedented. And I personally also think, for example, if you, if you look at the issue of, of uh, of, of ownership, well, if you, if you try to restrict the question to a research environment, it becomes easier to tackle. Uh, because ownership of data in general, I, I cannot see how you can solve that in, in, in general because it is simply too vast and, and too dynamic. But if you refine the question to who owns the data that have led to certain uh, pieces of research which have been be reviewed and accepted by the community, community. It becomes much easier because you you know that there is quality. Otherwise, it would not have been peer reviewed. You know who is the author. You know uh, you know that there are probably uh, uh, instruments being put in place for for uh, for consent. So I think that that is really something we have to uh, see at different levels. I, the example I always use is that uh, hospitals are very easily to be convinced to, 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 lib to give their data if it is for a research question to find, uh, for example, how uh, asthma is related to traffic jams in, in, in urban cities. They will not do so if the project is sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, or they will do so on condition that the IPRs are taken into account, and they will certainly not do so if they don't know where the question comes from. So there are gradations in the problem there which, which are related to the nature of the research uh, question. but. 
a generic open data policy uh, uh, is, is, is simply impossible. Now, and, and if, I, if I may to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to tackle the issue of quality, I think if we go, but that's a speculation, if we go to an environment where open data becomes a default attitude of a researcher, which means that the downloadability of his data might be an indicator of the quality of his of him as a scientist, as a data provider. And that, will be, and that can be then taken into account in the evaluation for his career, for his tenure. Uh, you, you can easily imagine in 20 years' time that how many peer-reviewed articles did you publish, how many data sets, how, and what, what has been the use of that, as an example. Now, that is an inherent mechanism of the science world that we know works very well, which is peer-reviewed uh, control. So you can assume that the more open the system is, the better the quality will become, because there is much more control. So that is a little bit the way I, I would, I would uh, look for, uh, for, for uh, solutions. And then finally, on, on the consenting, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very important because we will see much more, much, that's my personal view, uh, we will see more and more uh, distributed ways of collecting data rather than centralizing them. Uh, you, we all know the example of, of the, the health applications on your iPhone that at some point in time, it was discovered that actually in, in the back of your activity, the health application registered how many steps you did, how many run, kilometers you run, and then those data were sold or used by, by, by uh, Apple-related companies to do X, Y, Z on that. So that kind of mechanism whereby the data remains on your phone, but the, the software, so to speak, to use them is, is traveling around, is, is a completely new challenge because if it, it is all centralized in, in one data center, then it's relatively easy. If it is no longer is centralized but decentralized, actually a little bit blockchain if you want, you, you can even think in that direction in the future, then, then you get real big tough uh, uh, questions on the table. Now, how do we organize consent here and what are the, the procedures to put in place there? You mentioned the ownership question again. I think it's also this question is, is now so much discussed because of the uh, increasing amount of data production and data processing. And we're talking about Internet of Things now. We'll be, in 10 years, we'll be all be part of like a thing in the Internet of Things. Uh, if you look, uh, hear what informatics are projecting, it's a bit scary also, I must say. Um, the, ownership, the ownership question, um, I know very well in practice, people think that data they have stored are their property. And you can also look into contracts or you can look into standard terms. Um, we provide you with the ownership of the data or we transfer the ownership of it. From a legal point of view, there is no ownership in data. There's no property in data. What, what you might have is, in very exceptional cases, copyright on, on parts of the information. What you might have is a database right. The database right, if you extensively construe it may apply to censored um, to data which are produced by sensors and if you from the sensor it goes directly into database you might include this um, data produced by sensors into the database right but to the rest of course there's trade secret but this doesn't play much role in research field beyond that there's no property right in data of course, the problem is the practice is not, not aware of it. And even if, if you go to the industry, people don't know this. So they treat data as if they're their property. That's why also the European Commission is thinking about introducing a, ra a right which would accrue to the producer of the data. But there are lots of practical problems. For example, if I always take the example of a car. The cars we use today have about 100 sensors included already. They're producing all kinds of data. You can measure the air in the car and to, to evaluate if the driver is drunk, for example. It's possible already today. So, then if you have this data, you know, about the, how the car is driving, the speed, what the driver is doing, who should be the owner of this data? Is it the driver? Is it the owner? Is it the producer of the car? Is it the producer of the box who, with the sensors? All, all are candidates for such a property right. So who should be the owner? You have to make a decision who will be the owner, and then he can no negotiate his property. So already the question, who should be the owner, is quite unsolvable. And the next problem is, of course, with personal data, you can always say, which person is the information about? He, he's a data subject. If you apply such a right beyond personal data to any kind of data, 
then you have to decide what is the subject of this right. You mentioned data that are stored on my mobile. If I, like pictures or like, like address data or something, if I transfer this data to another mobile, is it the same data or is it different data that are stored on the next mobile? I think it's different data. So what is data about? Basically it's about information. So you would have a right on information and then of course you have the, same, the problem I mentioned, you would protect any information, would be complete shift from freedom, free flow of information to a property concept of information. And I think it wouldn't work in practice. So that's the problem I have with the property, the, of, of, uh, the general ownership of Of course, uh, you have different levels of legal ownership. You can say one thing is property right, you can also exclude others from using information. A bit lower level would be to just have def like defensive rights. So if somebody destroys my data, I can have a claim to damages. But of course, not the same as property. Right? The, this, the second we have already. Right? So if somebody destroys my computer, I may also have a claim to the value of the information or the data that were destroyed. Hmm? But it's not a right to control. We are third parties. So um, the, the question of data ownership is very interesting. But as I, meant, as I said, I think um, there will be, or even in the future, there will be no property right in data in general, but, but only the Commission, at least the policy of the Commission, is more to, to promote the free flow of information. And if uh, some kind of right is, is good for promoting this free flow of information, we might, might see it, but we won't have a property right in, in data in general. And of course the question of consent, <laughs> I think we, we mentioned a couple of times already, on the basis of existing law, it's very difficult to really have a, a working, practically working concept of consent that really lives up to the data protection requirements. What's, what's happening in practice is some, some kind of consent that is not really challenged in court. So it's, it's, it's somehow it's working in practice, but if you really take the law seriously, most of what's happening in practice is, is not really according to, I would say, according to the law. So. Okay, uh, before the coffee, because everybody is waiting for the coffee, a final question. Uh, hi, I'm Prodromos Tsiavos. I'm from the Athena Research Center and also I'm serving at the uh, European Patents Office uh, Patent Academy. So um, um, I was wondering about the link between the patent data and the research data. And uh, in, in the uh, diagrams you've shown, uh, we've seen that IPR is the primary reason for opting out. Uh, but I think it is important to understand what exactly that means. Because even if we see the patent system, the patent system, we tend to think about it only as a protection and as a closing system, but it has a very strong component of disclosure and publication. And the European Patent Office has an enormous wealth of data related to patents. Um, so um, my first question is, uh, to what extent the question of opting out is a timing question? rather than a substantial question of not releasing the data. Because it could be that I release the data along or after I actually submit my patents. And the second question is, how could we align more the uh, data we have with regards to the state of the arts, uh, which exists either, either in the national patent offices or at the European patent office, uh, with the data that we have um, as, a, as research communities? And uh, what I mean is uh, first to, to do a simple mapping between, let's say, Frascati and IPC. And secondly, how we, could we actually try to reuse some of these data? Because uh, they are exceptionally relevant for our researchers in order to position their research within the state of the art. Thank you. I, I assume. So um, on, on your, first, your first point, most of what you said I use as an answer when we are visitors from industry in, in our office, yeah, but you know, all this openness, uh, uh, they, they, all, they seem to think that, this is, that we want to install the last communist regime in Western Europe. Eh? So it, <laughs> so, but hang on, I mean, also before the internet existed, you could, there was a way to protect your research, and that was called patents. And the patents, I, as you say, are also a very good example in uh, of, of control disclosure. So I, I think that, again, that's why I think uh, some of the concern is a little bit overblown. And eh? there are the, what has worked in the past will also work in the digital age. And that is, patents is a, is a fantastic 
instrument to, to protect your, your RPRs. Now, on, on the beginning of your question, um, so the, the box is ticked. We want to opt out because of we assume that there might be a problem from an IPR point of view. That's, that's, that's how it works. And then what we now would like to see is a little bit more substantiation of that. But there again, I mean, uh, we, what we try to, in, to, to train our project officers now, we know some, but hang on, if that is put on the table in the discussions, please flag to, the, to these uh, good people that there still is something in, like a patent that can, pretend, that can do the job perfectly well. So you can, I would say, maybe not so much in health research per se, but uh, to a very large degree, you can marry openness with, with uh, co uh, property control as well if, if you use patents. Now, and I personally think that it would be fantastic if the databases of the, of the IPO would be used in, in the science cloud. So I, I can see you as a, as a big provider there, as one of the nodes uh, for that kind of uh, data in, in the overall architecture of, of the science cloud. You know, the way we, we, we see the science cloud, it's a, it's a federation of data centers and, and, and clouds, and that, that, that could be... Uh, one of them. Now, on the, the second question, I, I, I lost it in the meantime. So, what was the second question? Let's say that we have a research. So, I think this is more like a call to actually do it possibly in uh, one of the subsequent projects, how we could actually map classifications because they help the positioning of research within the state of the art as understood uh, by the patent system. I think that would be very yeah. valuable. Yeah, but that, that's why we have RDA, no? So that to, to find solutions uh, for this kind of uh, synchronizing the, 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 the data series indeed. Yeah, I still remember the time when you went, wanted to find out about patents, you had to go to the library and there was the wall of books and patent, patent uh, applications you had to browse through. Today is much easier already to the databases we have at hand. Maybe just one small comment to the first question. Um, patent doesn't protect the information, but only the invention. So the information is free. So in this sense, there's no conflict between patent law and, and free use of data for research. Unless there's some copyright, sometimes there's some copyright, of course, on, on the uh, patent file, the patent application, but uh, um, that's not really impediment to, to using of the, of, the, of the patent information. That's just the idea of the patent system. To yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, in the early stage of the application. Yeah. Uh, I want to add something not to this question, but uh, to another question with the uh, uh, ownership of data. This is also a very practical problem with the use of the CC licenses, for example. So often uh, data which is not protected by IP rights is licensed, for example, by the CC BY, which actually doesn't make a sense if there is no copyright protection. But it uh, then has a kind of a factual protection because the next user is using this license again, so um, it, yeah, it appears this protection which is actually not existing. Okay, I, I completely agree with you. In fact, we are making a document, a lot of people from CC, and that was one of the, our points, to please don't use CC BY when there is no copyright. So thank you very much for this panel.